team. Yes. Hi, welcome all once again. What we'll introduce to you our expert speaker, Mr. Anurag Yadav. Anurag is an AWS authorized instructor and a Google certified cloud architect and is a core techie at heart. He brings over two decades of rich experience in architecting and engineering large scale distributed systems and software products. While working with global giants like IBM, HCL, and Blue Yonder, he has delivered many successful projects to multiple Fortune 500 clients, including the development of SaaS systems, handling multi-million dollar transactions per day. With an exceptional understanding of AWS, he brings deep expertise in architecting and operating large-scale system on cloud using containers and Kubernetes. He has long and rich experience in architecting and developing microservices using relational and non-relational databases. Additionally, he has always been passionate about teaching and learning. In his journey, he has trained and mentored more than a thousand professionals. Also, he is author of software architecture and technology of large scale systems, the best seller course on Udemy with 30,000 plus learners and a 4.5 star rating. He did his BTEC from IIT in the year 1999. Welcome, Anurag. Thank you, Ashutosh. Ashutosh, I'll have to ask you this first. If I'm audible, because initially your voice was breaking, so I'm not sure if how my voice is right now. You Anurag, your somehow. voice is your voice is totally audible. Okay, and my video is on. And is my screen shared? Probably not. Yes. Screen I need to share. If you start sharing a screen, you have the controls. Okay. Thank you, Anurag, for joining us. You may take okay. over. Thank you, Ashutosh, for the introduction. It was a very generous introduction. It's all so, you. So with that done, we'll directly jump into our agenda, which is we are here to discuss agility, scalability, reliability with Docker and Kubernetes. So in the next one and a half hour about what we are going to do is, we are going to look into some of the capabilities of Docker and Kubernetes, why we need them, what, how they can help us in uh, deploying our uh, systems, especially the ones which are um, in, uh, large scale systems. So we are going to look into that. There will be demonstration. So I will take you through some slides, which will give you some idea of, if you, let's say you are new to Docker or Kubernetes, it will give you an idea why we are using them. And there will be some demonstration just to solidify what we learn or understand over here okay with that let's get started so the agenda over here is we are going to look into docker how we can what docker is how it came about so how containers came about and how do they help us and then we will look into kubernetes how we can orchestrate containers in cloud or on premises over here we'll be focusing on cloud only because cloud gives us easy access to infrastructure and uh, there we have to create a kubernetes cluster it can be created in minutes so for those reasons we will just look into cloud a bit why we need cloud in the context of docker and kubernetes and that's about it that would be our agenda and let's get started First, let's talk about Docker containers. So why do we need Docker containers? Let's start with that question first. 
So when you have to recreate your environment, let's say this is one such environment where a developer is developing some application. In this case, let's say it's a web application and it is being developed on some operating system. And let's take the case of a Java web application. It can be for that matter, any other web application or any other kind of service or application that we are building. So here the example is of a Java application. It does not matter. It could have been anything else also. So a JVM is required and it is installed over here. Then there is a web container, let's say a Tomcat container or JT or whatever on which a web application can run, right? And then the developer would have set certain environment variables, certain configuration. Now, if this environment has to be replicated for let's say test, and you may have to replicate it for other things also, but let's just start with if this environment has to be replicated for test, then you will need another machine where you will test, right? On that machine, first we need to make sure that the version of operating system is correct. In fact, on both machines, it is as per the software. <clears throat> Sorry about that. It, it is as per the guidelines of our project or the requirements of a project. All these things are being selected perfectly. We need to make sure about that. Similarly, version of JVM, right? Web container. And then once all these software, once we have installed for recreating the environment, we will take the same binary. So in this case, in case of Java, it would be, let's say, dot jar file, or it can be war file, whatever is the case, right? That will be taken and that will be placed over here in this particular environment and with which we will test. In this environment, again, we'll have to do set environment variables and we'll have to also set configuration. We'll have to redo that. In this environment, these configurations can be different also. Things like uh, the port numbers that you are going to use or the, any URLs you are using, right? A, let's say you are doing some encryption. So the keys that you are using for encryption, they can be different. So things like that can be different from environment to environment. But certain things, let's say like the software on which your particular application depends on, that should remain fixed. So few things like environment variables can vary, but other than that software dependencies, they remain fixed. And we need some way to make sure that these dependencies, they remain fixed in all environments. So how do we go about that? So one way of dealing with this is that we do it manually as I just showed over here. But the problem over here is that this process is error prone because it's manual, plus it is time consuming. If we have to repeat it, it's not really repeated, uh, repetitive. We can make mistakes because we are doing it manually and it may not give us the same results every time. So we wanted to do better than this. And why it was important to do better than this? Because when we are creating environment, and especially if we are creating environments for a large scale system where there are lots of components, recreating environment is not a trivial thing as it would be in case you have a monolith application which has got let's say one service, one web app, one database, very few components. But if you are playing with a very large scale system, then recreating environment becomes a serious issue. So this is one dimension. So we are looking at the problem of recreating environment. One of the problem, one dimension of the problem is that we have lots of components in an application that we will need to recreate. Other thing is that these environments that we are talking about, there can be multiple such environments. So let's say you're doing functional testing, you're doing development, performance test, system test, production. If you have preparing a, let's say another site for disaster recovery, right there also you need to do deployment for which you'll have to recreate your 
uh, application. So there, this is an added uh, dimension to that kind of challenge. The other would be that let's say you want to increase the scale at which you are operating. So today, let's say you were you needed ten instances of a particular service. After let's say a few months, you may need thousand. Right? Entirely possible your application is becoming popular. So now let's say for 10 instances, your problem of recreating environment was not that uh, uh, that difficult. But now with the number of instances as they are increasing, this problem is becoming severe. So something needs to be done about this problem. And now we will look into various ways we can solve this problem. One of the way we can solve this problem is through script-based automation. So we can write some script which can install all this software on our machine, right? And in the end, we can also, if we want to launch whatever application we want to launch, that also we can launch through these automation scripts. So these scripts are a great way of automating um, the recreation of our environment. It is uh, a reliable thing to do because right now we have some code and it's going to work as long as the inputs are same and the code is same, it is going to give us repeatable output, right? So easily repeatable and it's going to be reliable. The issue over here is that if we have to recreate our environment through these scripts, it can take time. And depending upon what you are installing, it can take up to five to 15 minutes, anything like that, right? It all depends on what you are installing. So let's say if you are installing a database, easily it will take 15 minutes. Or for that matter, many there are many other things which can take time. So the point over here is that this installation through automation scripts can take time. So can we do better than this? Certainly we can do better. Uh, we can do better than this, and we have been doing, and we have been doing better than this by using virtual machines. What are virtual machines? So virtual machines are those uh, machines which run on physical machine and operating system with the help of a hypervisor. So hypervisor creates a virtual environment where it can run an image as a machine and that we call as virtual machine. So virtual machine you can think of as something which will look like that you are working on a entirely different operating system. It has got its own um, file system underneath it. It has got its own process space, right? So it will have everything that you interact with on a system, it will have on its own. So over here, let's start with this, although we can have multiple virtual machines on a single machine, but Let's start with this simple example, where on a machine, where we have a hypervisor, we have started a virtual machine. And this virtual machine, we can create them through images or through a virtual machine that we have prepared, we can create image from that also. And what is an image? Image is that all these applications that are that you might be running on a virtual machine, first you would have installed all those applications, all um, installed that application and all its dependencies. So where do they go? They get installed on the physical storage of that particular virtual machine. And then we take a copy of that physical storage and we call that as an image. And this is special in the sense that we can reuse this copy, we can reuse this image to create a new environment on a new machine. In this case, we'll not have to install anything. It is just almost like that we have taken a copy of the disk from one machine and we have put it on the other machine. Just that all this thing need to be done with the help of hypervisor, which help us in running virtual machine. So this process is going to save some time for us. The way you can think of it this way is that 
when you have a new machine or you want to get your machine formatted you go to a system operations team and you say that my machine needs to be formatted please reinstall operating system and applications on it the way your system admin team handles it is through images they do not format they, they do not do this that they'll format it they will put operating system and then they will install various other applications that you may need so let's say you need uh, microsoft word right for editing and you may need vpn in your office or things like that so there can be multiple such applications so instead of installing them separately they take an image like this and they give you your machine by loading this image on your machine right so virtual machines are similar in concept so the reason i am trying to tell you is this is going to save time for you from what if we compare it with uh, the time that we were consuming in automation so this process has got all the benefits of automation this process can be automated and uh, here the installation part is completely automated whatever goes on to disk of one machine is copied exactly so this process is quite reliable it is repeatable and the gain that we have made is it is time efficient right time efficient it is better than automation other thing that virtual machine started providing is that virtual machine can provide you isolation also so on the same machine same host operating system let's say this is windows right here you can start a virtual machine which is let's say this one is running on windows this one is running on linux this one is running on mac so that's entirely possible if your hypervisor supports it that can be done on this uh, the more importantly you can run different different applications in their own caged environment or isolated environment now if let's say one particular application is under heavy load or it is inefficient in processing and it is hogging more cpu then if you are not running in a separate isolated environment if you are running directly on a single environment then this can hog uh, this can aff start affecting other applications as well so another benefit of virtual machines is that you can run your applications in their own environments so apart from this being repeatable efficient less time consuming the other benefit that it gives us gave to us is that here we have isolated environment now the there is an issue over here and the issue is this operating system what is the issue with this operating system the issue is that if you are running let's say three operating systems on one single machine all of these operating systems they are going to consume resources let me stop on my or your voice is breaking this was 350 ashutosh just a check is my voice okay someone is saying that i think arti is saying my voice is breaking can you please confirm if my voice is okay okay others are saying my voice is okay so i'll go by that so arti you may like to check it may be a problem at your end okay thank you now coming back to these operating systems which are running in virtual machine thank you everyone these operating system they are going to consume resources on our machine and uh, that's one problem right the other problem is that the images that we use to create these virtual machines they are very large in size they will not be smaller in size we are talking about gb we are talking about easily starting from 2 gb uh, although it, it will be hard to see find a 
any uh, useful image which is which will occupy 2 gb of space but anything useful will be talking about 5 gb 15 gb anything of that sort right? and so that that's one problem you'll have to carry these images around if you want to replicate um, environment or um, applications through these heavy images the other problem is that this is almost like a machine when a virtual machine when you start its operating system boots so it can easily take up to so let's say starting from 20 30 seconds to one minute right so on an average you can think it will minimum take 30 seconds for any operating system to boot up and come up in a meaningful way that it can start serving um, through its application, right? So the OS boot time is a problem. So whenever, let's say you have a system and it's running through virtual machines and suddenly you see that there is a lot of load that is coming onto your system. So you, what you normally do is you scale your system, you add more machines and on top of that, you start your application more instances and if your instances are going to run on virtual machines these virtual machines will take time to come up because this os is going to first boot only when this os is ready then only your application will be started it will be launched so whatever time your application takes that time plus this os boot time so your application finally is going to take time to come up so if it takes, let's say, if, if there is a two minutes of delay or something like that, then you will not be able to handle your request for that duration of time, right? And delays can be larger than that as well. Okay, so that's the issue with virtual machines. Now let's see, can we do better than this? So we discussed that this operating system, if we are putting in this virtual machines, that is creating the that is creating a problem for us so what can we do instead of hypervisor something called as containers were created docker is one such container so you will install on your machine docker container and there you are going to run a container so container you can think of it as a lightweight virtual machine which does not have an operating system in it right it is finally going to use some operating system libraries that is how you need to think about it so i'm just going to come to that so here also you start with an image but this image is a lightweight image you can write certain instructions and with the help of that you can create this image and this image is lightweight because it will not have operating system in it here you will instruct what is your operating system environment in which you are going to run your application which is saying that so you can say i want to run this let's say as a ubuntu linux debian linux anything of that sort you can say over there but that doesn't mean that we are putting entire operating system in this image we are just saying that this image is compatible with so and so operating system. So this image is quite lightweight. Now using this image, very much the way we created a virtual machine, we will create a container. Container, a lightweight virtual machine. Why, why are we calling this lightweight? Because over here, there is no operating system over here. This is directly running on Docker runtime. Okay, with the help of Actually, it is running on your operating system itself. Docker runtime is just helping doing things uh, for it to be able to run on this operating system or to be managed on this operating system. So these containers, you can think of as something which directly runs on the physical uh, or uh, the host environment that is there, okay? Let's compare this. The gains that we have got over here, whatever gains we have made with virtual machines, all those gains we have, 
plus this is lightweight and because there is no operating system involved over here it is going to boot very fast so your containers they come very fast containers will be up let's say in certain microseconds less than a second and whatever time application within that container take let's say 5 seconds only that much of time will be consumed by your application to come up so you can think of if you have to scale your solution your containers can come up in 5 seconds where this 5 second is really coming from your application itself okay plus because in these containers we have so on the left hand side we have virtual machine environment on the right hand side we have container environment in container between these two environment the important difference is that over here we have these guest operating system over and above this underlying host operating system right but in case of container we just have host operating system these containers are actually running using this host operating system right so that's the container technology so these containers they use um, process isolation namespaces and things like that to provide isolated environment for containers as well here by default they will share your resources that are available on the machine but you have the ability to say that so and so container will not consume more than 2 cpu it will not consume more than let's say 4 gb ram right so things like that you can say with containers as well right now because they are lightweight they do not consume many resources now on the same machine you can run many more containers right so if you could run let's say three virtual machines on a particular host machine then maybe you can run 10 12 containers over there or maybe more right but definitely you can store more number of containers over there so what we have seen over here is containers are lightweight virtual machine right they are fast when they come up they occupy less resources on our machine they do provide isolation and they have all those benefits that we talked about now when we are create, recreating our environment the process is automated everything is packaged into the image all dependencies the software dependencies that we talked about they are contained within an image this image has got all the software dependencies so this is fast reliable and better than virtual machine if we have a linux host and we create one docker image then that image we can run which have windows host os okay so this is one thing let me explain this and generally i'll take questions in the end but this one looks important so i'll go ahead with this question now because we do not have any hypervisor in between and everything is practically running on host operating system let's say this host operating system is linux what you can run over here is linux containers so that is the way it works with containers because there is nothing over here which can provide let's say if you want to run windows container over here there is nothing over here to provide windows system call implementation right so that is a trade off with containers now if you let's say take a case of mac let's say i am working on mac and i run docker containers on my uh, on mac so how do docker containers run on mac mac they run because the docker that i install on mac it launches it uses a virtual machine so at least some years till some years back that was the case now it has started using containers as well so but just to give you an idea it will launch a virtual machine 
and Linux virtual machine. And on top of that, it will run containers. So Linux containers you can run on Mac because Mac, on Mac, there will be a virtual Linux virtual machine running for you. And Docker will take care of that. On Windows, we have similar options. One is on Windows, there is WSL2 option, which Windows provides. So this is Windows subsystem for Linux. If you install that, if you configure that, you can run Linux containers on it. Initially, containers came on Linux platform only. There were features added to Linux operating system to create these containers. Subsequently, I think, year 2006 onwards or somewhere after that, Windows also started supporting. Windows also did um, those features which can support these containers. And so WSL2 is one way you can run Linux containers over here. You can also run native containers on Windows where the configuration that you will create will be a little different from Linux. You will not use Linux kind of commands over there. You would use those kind of commands that you use in um, command script or PowerShell script on Windows. So that kind of um, scripting you would do to create configuration for Windows. And that way you can run uh, Windows native containers on Windows. So both options are possible. You can run Windows native containers using hypervisor, um, hypervisor which is comes along with Windows. I think Hyper-V is the name. Or you can use Linux environment provided by Windows. So both choices are available. So I hope uh, that question is answered. Asked by Shivang Sony, right? And if you have any question, once I am through with this demo, you can again ask any question. And then in the end, at the end of the presentation, because we have a lot of participants over here, if we go into questions, uh, maybe we'll not be able to finish on time. So what we will do is at the end of uh, this whole presentation, that will be your main opportunity to ask questions and whatever questions you have, I'll try to answer them. Okay, now let's get into a short demonstration. In this demonstration, what I'm going to uh, demonstrate is some features of containers. So here is a demonstration where we are going to launch two containers. One is product service container. So it's a microservice. So generally, I have some code where I can launch uh, a microservices based environment where there are multiple services, but I have just plugged out two services out of that for this demonstration. And one of them is product service. If you send a REST request to this product service, it can give you product, okay? And then in microservices environment, you generally use a discovery service when, which is used in this way that any service that comes up registers itself with discovery service. So discovery service knows what all microservices and what all different instances of those microservices are running in, in that particular environment. So discovery service has that information. So that is another service that we are going to run over here. Now, why are we doing this? I'll explain you this in a bit. Now, once we bring this up, we will access this particular application using an HTTP client. So we are going to use a curl utility, which is an HTTP client. Um, if you are on Windows, you would have used Postman utility for sending HTTP request or REST request. So curl is a command line HTTP client. That's how you can think of it. People who work on Linux or Mac OS, they would know what curl is. Right, so curl is an HTTP client. So we will use this HTTP client to send requests to product service to validate whether product service is indeed running or not. Now, the special thing over here is that we are going to create a separate network for our Docker containers that we are going to launch. 
So let's say I have my machine where I'm going to give you this demo. It is running in some network and this outside line, this line is my host network, okay? So my machine is running on the host network and that's how I am doing this uh, Zoom presentation using that network, I'm able to access internet. So I'm in some kind of network. Now within, on top of my machine, Docker will create a network for me, which will be an isolated network, which any application that is running on the host network will not be able to access. We will have to make special arrangement for that access. And we need that access because we want to access this product service, right? So this is host network. We want to go from host network to Docker network. So we will do that. Other thing that we are going to do is through a browser, we are going to connect to discovery service. So here also we need this arrangement that from host network, we should be able to go into this Docker network that we are going to create, right? So we will see how do we do that. But why do we create this network? We create this network so that now I can run multiple containers in this network. And now each container can have its own IP address. When you work in this kind of environment where you have your own network, each application or container that you are launching has got its own um, IP address, then that gives you a feel of that you are really working. You are able to simulate a distributed environment where you are working on multiple machines. Each machine has got its own IP address and you can start your application there on any port. There won't be any conflict because they are all running on different, different IP addresses. So this gives you a real simulation of a distributed system as if you are working with multiple machines which are connected through a network. And what is that network? That network is Docker network. So we do have some shortage of time because we need to get to Kubernetes as well. So I'll try to finish this as quickly as I can. And for your reference, these are the commands that I am going to use. What I'm going to do is I'm going to create an image, a Docker image. I'm going to create a network. And then I'm going to launch two containers, which I will then try to access. And that will be the demonstration just to give you an idea. If you are new to Docker, that what, what Docker containers are really all about. So let me go to projects, microservices, inside that Docker. Here, those commands that I showed you so that I don't have to type these long commands. You don't want to waste time on typing. So I'll copy them and I'll run them. So here what I'm doing is docker build minus T. I'm building an image. To build this image, I need a configuration. I'll just show you that configuration. What configuration is needed? Okay. I think I'm in the wrong directory right now. Inside this, I need to go into microservice and probably now I am in the right at the right place. So let me show you Docker file over here. This is the file that I told you in the beginning. Let me start with a configuration file and using this configuration file, we can create an image. So here I'm saying that I'm going to work with in an environment which is like Ubuntu. So I will need certain libraries. It's not the whole operating system, but just the libraries which will interact, which will make system calls to the underlying operating system. Right. So for that, we are indicating that we are going to use Ubuntu over here. This particular uh, thing that we are doing is optional over here. 
right? I'm just installing some debugging tools over there, but so I'll ignore that. Here, this is a statement. A run over here is a Docker instruction. And after that, whatever I have put over here is actually a Linux command. And what is that Linux command? This Linux command is saying install JDK on this particular image. So whatever command that you will that you will use on a Linux machine, right, to install JDK, that command I have put over here. And then the other thing that I am doing is I am copying the jar file, right? The jar file is where my application code is, which is what we I want to run. So that also need to go into the image, right? So that it can run our application. So this is that particular part. And then the last part over here is that here we are providing, we are saying entry point is a script called docker entry point dot sh. And this will launch these, uh, these jar files. It can, we, we can provide it some argument and it can launch based on that argument, any of these jar files. So we are going to use this image for launching discovery.jar and this product.jar that is over here. So these two, we are going to launch. What I was trying to show over here is that you can create a configuration file like this. Once that configuration file is ready, you can issue a command like this, right? This is docker build minus T is for tag. I'm giving a tag name to this machine, basically uh, to this image. This is basically the name of this image. And I am going to run this. Okay. So first time, if you are running this on your machine, it will take some time. It is going to download Ubuntu. It is going to take time to install Java, right? The first time. But next time you do it, because it was already done on my machine, it does some caching. So it works very fast. So it has created the machine. It has created the image. You can see the images by doing this Docker images. And this is the image NTW microservice that we are interested in. It got created two days ago, right? So that's why it did not recreate it. It, it could find out that the same instructions that you are Running over here, I have already done those instructions. That image is available. So why to redo it again? So it is available over here. So you will create a Docker file and you simply you can create an image as well. So now that image is ready. Through this file, this image is created. Now we need to launch this image on some machine and this in this case it is my laptop from which I am doing the demo. There we are going to run this container. So let's do that. How do we do that? Let's look at okay. Before we do that, let's look at I told you that we are going to create a network. So maybe this network might already be created. So let me just check that. I think the my net one network, this is the one that I need, is already there on my machine. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to say Docker network, delete my net one. Okay. Just one second. What does it say? Come on. I think delete is not the command, maybe remove is the command RM. Okay, that worked. Okay. Now, if I list the networks again, that my net one network is gone. So now I want to create that network. So I'll do Docker network, create my net one. Let me just check the name that, that is the name we want. Yes. 
my net one is the name that we need. So I'm now going to create this network. So this network is created. If I list the network, my net one has reappeared again. So it is as easy as that if you want to create a network. Now time to launch the containers. Let's first launch discovery service. So the command is docker run. We are running it on in detached mode, which means it will run in the background. And then there is a port mapping. I'll just explain you that. Then the next argument is the name of this container is discovery service. Then minus minus network my net one, which we just created. Then the next argument is the name of the uh, image, uh, Docker image. And then there is the argument that we want to provide to our application so that it starts discovery service, discovery microservice. So what is this port mapping? Port mapping, here we discussed that that I want to make a call from this host network. This client is there in this host network. It has to go into Docker network. So if I start anything on 8080 over here, and if I say on this network, go to localhost 8080, it will not go to this particular service because this particular service is not running on localhost. Localhost is this one this host network, this one is the local host for me, right, on this host network. Because I have started Docker container on a separate network, now I need a special mechanism. So what we do is we do a port mapping, we create a port over here. So let's say we will create a port 80 over here, right? And we'll say map this port 802 this port 8080. So this is called as port forwarding. Now, if this through this client, if I say localhost port 80, because this port 80 on this local host is mapped to 8080 of Docker network, right? Of so and so IP address. Now our request will go there. Okay. So just to give you an idea over there, we can talk about this for next 15, 20 minutes also, but we don't have time for that. If you have any question, I can answer later on as well. But this is a mechanism that we have created to send requests from one network to the other network. And that's why we have specified this. So now let's launch our discovery service. So discovery service container is launched. What is it doing? We can check Docker logs minus F the name of the container. Name of the container is discovery service. So this is what this discovery service is doing. It, it is showing us the logs as they are coming out. So looks like this service has come up. It has taken about 16 seconds time. But this is the time that our application has taken. This is not the time that Docker container has taken. Docker container, when we launched, you saw that it came up pretty fast. Okay, now it's time to launch product service. So I'm going to launch product service over here. Let's also run this in detached mode in the background. So I'll make that change. And this container came up. So it came up in no time. What is it doing? We can again check Docker logs in this time product service. Okay. So it came up on port 8080 and it has also communicated with discovery service. But over here, I have used one more thing in this particular command. And what was that? that information I will show you. This command is same as what I did for starting discovery service. The only difference over here is that here through this minus E option, 
minus e, I have provided an environment variable where I'm saying eureka dot client dot service URL default zone. Basically, where is my discovery service running? That configuration I have provided over here as an environment variable, and I'm saying over here that this particular uh, discovery service is running on this host discovery service and port 8761. So that is something we have told our product service because it has to register itself with discovery service. Now let's do one thing. Let's test out both of these applications. So that let's first go to the browser. Now I have mapped port 8761 to the Docker network port, so it should be able to connect to that. So it has opened discovery service and it has got one registration that product service has registered with it. So that way we can see that within that network, product service is able to communicate with discovery service. That's how it was able to register. And we from outside through a browser, we can communicate with this. Last thing, that just send a request to product service and then we'll be done with this demo. So let me open a different terminal and from here I'll send the request. So I'll say HTTP, this time I'm saying local host. I cannot use the host name that is there in Docker network that is internal to Docker network. So I'll say host, local host, and 8080 because I have mapped port 8080 of local host to 8080 of product service. Okay. Now over here, let's check the health of this service. Okay. So it has given us some response over here. So that way we are able to communicate to this Docker container as well. So pretty lightweight. Normally on this machine, I at any given day, if I start this seven, eight containers, I start easily without any issues. So because I'm not using virtual machines, I'm using Docker containers. I can simulate a complete distributed system on my machine and I can work on that. Right. So if you are a developer or a QA or whoever wants to work with the entire system on your machine and you can run that many containers on your machine, you will be able to do it with Docker containers. So we have spent about one hour on Docker containers and now it's time for us to move into Kubernetes. If there is any quick question, I can take that question. Otherwise, we will get time for which Mac laptop are you using? What's the configuration? It's a MacBook Pro. It has 16 GB RAM and uh, I think four CPU. Okay. So we can have these questions later on as well. I said kindly also share this PPT for our reference. I'll uh, see that if this PPT can be shared. We can talk about that. So I'll see if I can have a, some shared location where I can share this. Let's just see. Let's only take q and post. Yes. Let's do it after this. Two questions I answered just now. Rest I'll answer after Kubernetes demonstration. Eric, I'll request you to Wait till the end of the session and I'll reply to this question. I may have to ask you what exactly you are asking. Okay. So this is, this was Docker demonstration. Before we go into Kubernetes, one of the reasons to show you over here, this particular demonstration was that this Docker network was very helpful for me for simulating a distributed system and running a distributed system. But this network, can be created only on single machine. If I have three, four laptops at my home or servers at my home, the kind of network that I created over here cannot be created 
on multiple machines. Now, if I need more capacity, I have more machines, I would like to run these containers on multiple machines. So this network will not work. What I'll have to do is I'll have to do, there is something called as Docker Swarm, which helps me in creating this Docker network across multiple machines. But Docker Swarm is not that popular a tool because there is other tool which does this job much better and it came into the market much before uh, Docker Swarm came. And that tool is Kubernetes. So if you are convinced that container is the right way of deploying your solution, right? Then now the question is how do you operate with containers? So let's say you are doing uh, microservices or any other large scale uh, environment. And normally hear this when you are talking about microservices, you talk about Docker containers, nothing to do with microservices as such. If you have lots of components, which generally is the case with microservices, and you have to run lots of instances of those, you need this kind of Docker container kind of automation. And if you have to launch that many containers, you have to control its life cycle, right? Then you need a special tool. And that tool also help you run these containers across several machines. So that tool is Kubernetes. So these are some of its capabilities. Now we will look into what are some of the other capabilities along with this in a little more detail. And then we will get into a Kubernetes demonstration. So before we go into Kubernetes demonstration, let me tell you one thing. We are going to make use of cloud over here. So I'm going to cloud.google.com. The reason we are making use of cloud is, if let's say I have to run these containers on Docker, right? So let's say this is a web application container, this is a service container, right? This is a container for a database. I will need to get virtual machines for that, right? So let's say this is one virtual machine, this is second, this is third. I will need virtual machines for that. These virtual machines, they should be in some sort of network. So basically I need hardware and network to run my system. If let's say I'm doing this setup in on-premises. But if I take this to cloud, this becomes much easier for me. I'll not have to do any of these things. Instead, what I can do is, I can get rid of all this. I can go to cloud and there, cloud, I can easily start virtual machine whenever I need to. Cloud will provide me the network, virtual network that is needed so that I can start a Kubernetes cluster on that. So you can get these machines from cloud and you can yourself create Kubernetes cluster on with on or with these machines, right? But cloud not only gives you hardware and this network, it can give you one more thing which can make your job running Kubernetes very easy. And that is, it can give you um, two things. One is, cluster. Kubernetes will say, okay, please give me the machine where you want to, which you want to use in Kubernetes cluster where you are going to run your workload. And I'm going to create the entire cluster for you, which is something like if you go to console.cloud.google.com, you can go to a service, it's Kubernetes engine, it's a managed service. So if you go to any cloud, you can go to AWS, you can go to Azure, whichever is your favorite cloud, and there you can create a cluster. Here there is already a cluster created, demo cluster one. It is created in Asia South one Mumbai region, which is closest to me. It has got three nodes, which means it has got three machines. 
and put together they are using 12 cpus and 48 gb ram now it takes about 10 to 15 minutes for a cluster to get created so i pre created it so that we don't have to wait for it what you can do is you can hit this create cluster button and choose configure you can give your cluster any name that you want you can select a region for your cluster right it can be us it can be europe it can be asia whatever wherever you want to establish your cluster you can provide kubernetes release version then the most important thing that you will do is you can tell how many nodes you want to run in your cluster i have given three nodes over there i can write 30 also but if i do that i'll have to pay for it as it is for three nodes also i will pay but that still okay much better than starting 30 nodes so three nodes i have started this should be good enough for us and then the last important thing that you do over here is you can choose what kind of container technology you want you can choose what kind of machine you want and this is the most critical one so if you are running a larger system so i have so here there are machines like one cpu 4 gb ram the one that i have selected is four cpu and 16 gb ram so there will be three such machines that i have selected so on three such machines are cluster is going to run you can choose the size of the hard disk size of your machine in my case i have chosen 20 once you do that you can hit this create button once you hit this create button in about 10 to 15 minutes a cluster will be created for you which will look like this if you click on this cluster it will show you cluster properties but more importantly we want to go to workload if i click on workload right now nothing is running over here okay if i go to services and ingress nothing is running over here so these are the things that we are going to run these workloads they are basically going to represent our application there is one more thing that we need to see over here which we need from cloud these docker containers that we have created on my machine when kubernetes i run on cloud it will need access to these docker images so from where is it going to get that access there is a service called container registry on aws this is called as elastic container registry and over here it is container registry right so if you go over here there is this directory ntw in this there are images over here so let's say there is an image for cassandra database eureka discovery service fluentd for logging jmeter for testing load balancer for services postgres database services for microservices there is a single page application react and a python based web application so there are multiple um, images docker images that i have uploaded over here so that kubernetes can, whenever it needs a container image it can come here and it can get it okay some authorization will be required for this but that i have taken care of in the background okay so with that done now we have these images on the cloud and there is a cluster also which is available to us on the cloud this cluster right now i'll give you an idea of why do we want kubernetes we did discuss a few things but let's now fully understand this so i said that if you want to let's say if you want to launch thousands of containers or for a system and let's say you have hundreds of machine machine is not a problem but the problem over here is where is the automation which is going to launch that many containers on so and so, on so many machines we need a serious automation for that and kubernetes is one such automation it can start containers for you it can stop containers 
it can monitor your containers it can do health check of your containers whether your containers are running fine or not the applications that are there in that container they are responding or not right so health checks can find that out so kubernetes can do life cycle and monitoring for us other thing that i said that let's say our application we are running on multiple virtual machines we will need a network which is across machine so i'm not talking about that physical network which will be there on the machine we need a network which is over and above that which is called as overlay kind of network we need that network like we created for docker so that our applications can communicate with each other they feel as if they are in the same network and it has to be isolated so it won't be the host network on which virtual machines are running so we need such network so that that network can provide unique ip addresses to our containers it can provide names to our containers so that we don't have to really use these ip addresses we want to use dns names so we want kubernetes also to provide us dns which it does provide so along with network and dns that it provides uh, once you have that the ability that you get is all your containers actually pods and i'll come to what pods are right now when i say pod you think of them as containers so that your containers can get ip addresses and dns name so that we can make remote communication now let's say this is your web application uh, this is some system which has got a web application it has got services and in the end databases and the communication is flowing like this now for this application let's say we said that we can have for each component so this is a web application we can have multiple let's say hundreds of instances for this web application right now i have shown one and two right but similarly we can have hundreds of instances so when you have that any request come how will it be routed to one particular instance in other words how will it be load balanced so for that kubernetes provides something which is called as service so when i say service in kubernetes you think of these services which are doing load balancing right these are not the services in the context of microservices so when i want to say microservice i'll specifically say microservice and when i say service and the context is kubernetes then i am talking about the load balancer so kubernetes can provide you these services or load balancer for all of your components and it's just a matter of configuration in kubernetes so there is something that you need in large scale systems other thing that you need is that if let's say um, some of your container let's say they are not responding right you want kubernetes to monitor all the containers so that if some container stops responding for whatever reason then kubernetes can take out take that uh, container out and can start a new container a healthy container in place of that so the point is unhealthy containers should be replaced by healthy containers automatically for providing high availability so kubernetes will provide you that ability now your application let's say your application is running fine it has some issue right now your application is running let's say you are running a web application it is running on version 1 there are four instances of version 1 running now here i am showing you four instances but you can have hundreds of instances of your web application now there is an issue and you want to roll out a fix for that what you do not do generally is that you will not bring down hundreds of instances and then start new ones you do not do that what you do is rolling upgrade you take out one instance old instance of version 1 let's say and you replace it with new instance of version 2 and you do that one by one right and that is called as rolling upgrade 
so you replaced you added one more version 2 and now you want to take out one more version 1 so now you have two version 2 you want to take out another version 1 now you want to take one this one out and finally you ended up with version 2 only so this is a very common capability that is needed with um, when you are operating at scale and this capability is called as rolling upgrades you can do blue green deployments also canary deployments there are other kind of upgrades that that are possible but rolling upgrade is typical and i'm just letting you know that kubernetes has that capability to give you that kind of upgrade okay and here kubernetes is giving you all this in an automated fashion now we are going to get into a demonstration where i am going to demonstrate you how a uh, kubernetes can launch your containers so little more concept i'll give you about kubernetes so that you understand what is happening so your workload kubernetes has a concept of workload so if i go to workloads over here there is nothing running over here workload is actually Let's say your web application, your services, your databases—they are workloads. Some of your workloads can be stateless workloads. Generally, your front end, your services, you will try to keep them stateless, right? That is what you do for high scalability. And your databases, by definition, they because they manage state, they will be stateful. So Kubernetes provides you way of managing. these stateless workloads and stateful workloads separately because you need storages you need fixed identities network identities for stateful workload so you can model them differently in uh, kubernetes versus how you would model your stateless workload now the way you bring containers in kubernetes is that you launch something that is called as a pod and this pod is something which has got an ip address inside a pod usually you would run one container but wherever needed you can run more than more than one container as well where these containers which cannot work in isolation they have to work together then in a pod you can pack multiple containers as well right so let's say you have a container and now you want to do logging also of that particular container so that you can have another container over there but generally you as a philosophy you want to have only one business functionality being served out of a pod okay so this pod has got an ip address and pod has containers inside it and when kubernetes launches by your containers it launches them in these pods right and uh, so these pods are basically your workloads they represent your workload there is something called a service which i told you is load balancer which kubernetes will provide if we create a configuration and we are going to create that configuration so if i go to services we will get load balancers over here So there is something that you need to know. And just to summarize all this, what Kubernetes does, when we created a cluster, Kubernetes created a control plane, which is actually the brain of Kubernetes, which controls everything. And then we created three nodes, right? I said there are four GB, um, four CPUs and sixteen GB RAM machine. I created. three nodes in this diagram we have got four nodes okay and on these nodes what kubernetes when we provide a configuration so let's say this is a configuration if we provide this configuration to kubernetes kubernetes can launch using these configuration can launch pods or containers on these nodes okay kubernetes has got control over these nodes by virtue of kubelet and kube proxy that kubernetes cluster installs on each node 
Now, while this these pods are being created, from where the images are coming, I told you that they'll be coming from a registry, and in this case, we are using Google Cloud registry, from where these images will be pulled by Kubernetes, and the containers will be created on these nodes, right? So this, in a nutshell, how Kubernetes operates. Now we are going to go into the demonstration just to give you a more feel of what Kubernetes is. So I've shown you the cluster already. Okay, before I go there, let me tell you that we are going to launch a lot of components over there in different, different namespaces. But essentially what we are after right now is that we will have a web application and uh, not this test client, we will have a web application. That web application will talk to gateway service. Gateway service can talk to many microservices they are, which are there behind it, right? And gateway service looks at URL path and based on that, it can do the routing to different services, okay? Now when these, services they need to access any database for let's say they want to fetch some data there is a cassandra cluster in the background which will have three nodes right so when we launch kubernetes our uh, system on kubernetes you will see that three nodes for cassandra database will come up and uh, along with that there will be a lot of other things that are there in this system um, there will be Elasticsearch for monitoring, there's Prometheus, there's FluentD and all that stuff is there. But this will be our focus for this particular demonstration. So I hope that this, this setup is clear for you. We are launching, going to launch an application which has got in the backend a database. In the middle, we have services and then there is a Python based web UI, which will be our front end. So now to get the full appreciation of Kubernetes, how uh, automated uh, Kubernetes is, I am going to uh, launch Kubernetes, uh, my system over Kubernetes over here. So, Let's go to Kubernetes directory over here. And before I launch Kubernetes, let me just give you a little peek into how you create. So let's say I told you about product service in case of Docker container. I'll just show you how you do the configuration in Kubernetes. I do not intend to show you or teach you or anything of that sort that how exactly this configuration is done but I'm just showing you important elements over here. So there is a service, which is a load balancer. So this service, this load balancer will be created for product service. It will run on port 8.0 and the backend workload actually will be running on target port 8.0.8.0. So this load balancer request will come to 8.0 port for this product load balancer but when it uh, sends request to product container, which has product service, the request will be forwarded on port 8080. How many such product instances do we want? Right now it is mentioned as 10, uh, one over here. I can make it 100. If I make it 100, Kubernetes will launch 100 instances of product service provided you have that much of capacity. You have uh, nodes, that many nodes, with that much CPU and RAM that can run your service. From Kubernetes side, you can provide any number, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, whatever is your requirement, right? And which image it is going to pull? That you can put 
specify through an argument that for my container, right, this is the image. So right now I have put a variable over here. I have not hard coded it. I have not hard coded the revision ID, version ID of our application can change anytime. Basically container images and the path of our registry can also change. If I'm running this in a different environment in let's say AWS, I do not want to hard code Google container registry, right? So I have not hard coded this. So I will need some automation wherein when I start, um, when I do Kubernetes deployment, before deployment um, kicks in, it substitutes these variables over here. So this is the kind of configuration that you can do for Kubernetes, right? And now time to launch this. So I have a script called cube deploy. Let me just show you that cube deploy. It is a shell script which will substitute all those variables that I have told you and it will run a for loop. And ultimately what it does is it runs this command cube CTL apply minus F and whatever file name that we have. It may not be very clear over here from the script, but that is exactly what is this doing. So let's say if you, so it runs this kind of command. Let me show this. kubectl is a client. That is Kubernetes client which is installed on my machine. You can say apply minus F. And let's say your configuration for product service is there in product service dot YAML. So you can apply this command. If you do this, it will start product service containers on Kubernetes cluster that we are connected to. Okay. So before I can issue this command, so I have put this in the script, right? I did not want to uh, manually run them one by one. Again and again, that would have been a tedious task. So I've created that script. But right now, first thing that I need to tell my Kubernetes client cube CTL is where is the cluster located? So I'll get this connect string from this cluster. I will copy this. Okay. And let's put it over here. So this way it can connect to, it says cube config generated for demo cluster one. So now it knows where our Kubernetes cluster is located. So any command that I'll pass from my laptop right now will be executed on um, our cluster on the cloud. So let's go ahead and do that. So I've triggered this. And if you see this, there are a lot of things that it is trying to create over there. Let's just see what it is trying to create. For that, I told you that we'll have to go to workload. So it is trying to create these workloads. Kubernetes, you can control which containers are going to come first. So let's say this Cassandra, pods that are there, you can say this, that your service pods, let me just do a sorting over here. So these service pods, let's say inventory service, gateway service, product service, they are dependent on Cassandra, so they should not come up. If they come up first, they will not be able to run. So we do not want them to come up first. We want first Cassandra to come up, right? Where is Cassandra? Over here. So once Cassandra, is up, it says that it is ready. Only after that, these service microservices related pods will start. Similarly, there are other dependencies over here, Postgres database, RabbitMQ, Elasticsearch, Jaeger, Prometheus for monitoring. So all of these things are there, which will come up first, and then these services will start, right? So that's a 
feature of kubernetes you can control how your system will come up so those runtime dependencies also you can control let me refresh this now cassandra pods they are coming and it is saying that three are required and one has already been created so let's go into cassandra pods basically this is the stateful set that we have created so right now it is saying pod number 0 has come up pod number 1 is coming up it is pending and after that it will also start one more pod because for cassandra we have asked for three pods okay so that way slowly slowly they will all come up okay i have gone to cluster we need to go to workload okay so these they will come up we don't have to worry about them they will come up now let's go to services services i told you i just load balancer right and they have been created for us many of them where you see cluster ip let's say for order service nobody needs to connect to them externally no external client needs to connect to them so they get an internal load balancer of kind cluster ip as a web application we want should be able to connect externally there i have in the configuration i have said that service should be of type load balancer so it has created an external load balancer for it similarly for gateway service also i have created an external load balancer okay now if our pods are up we will actually connect so some of them they are coming up cassandra pod two of them are ready third one is coming up so i think this is a green signal for services so services will also come up where are the services let me sort so i put all these different workloads in different name spaces so let's say data namespace has got cassandra postgres rabbit and key monitor has got elastic search blue and d yeager and service has got all the micro services so the admin or gateway they are coming up it may take few more seconds or a minute i think they are coming up so a lot of them have become green now so that means they are coming up so looks like most of them are up right now cassandra is up our services are up maybe we can try our luck right now we can try connecting to the application so now this connect uh, system which is running on the cloud has exposed web application through a load balancer so i'm going to go through this load balancer and here is the uh, public ip through which we can connect so i'm going to click on that so i'm connected to this i'll have to sign in if everything works then i'll be able to sign in there is one default user already present in the database so okay now this we need to load some data over here so i'm going to go to data tab and if i look at data right now there is only one user data if i click on product let it come so there there is nothing so i'm going to create some data so i'm going to click this button create data it will create some products and then i'll be able to view some products and do something over here so that it creates some we are just testing our system if the system is working fine or not so now we can let's just select product we can add them to cart right go back to other product select a different product let's say add three units of it and now we can go to the cart and these are the items in our cart i'll create the order it is in process let's go to order screen order screen we have one order which is created so our application is working fine and what all different things we used for the service i had to authenticate myself right when i got in when i got into this 
So I will show you. I've sorted on namespace. So authentication was done by this auth service. Gateway service was anyway acting as a front end to every service. So gateway service was used, right? We were viewing products, so product service we needed, we created orders. So there order service and inventory service came into play, right? We created data that I created through admin service. So a lot of these service got deployed automatically, right? And these services, uh, without me having to worry that which one I need to start first, which one I need to start later, and in a very predictable way, without any issue, our system got deployed, okay? Now, let's say you want to see whether load balancing is working or not. So where can we check that? We can check that maybe at the gateway service, it has got three pods, right? So let's send request to gateway service. Can we send request to gateway service? We can send request to gateway service because uh, there is a load balancer that is exposed over there. So let's just click on this. I'll take the URL from here and let's just put this URL over here and let's um, what is the port? Default port is 80. And let's use this command curl. And I think status is what will give us some response. So it says that it has given a response that service ID is gateway service. And this is the service host from where the response is coming. And if it has also told us what is the time. So we are, so if we send this request, we are getting a response. Now let's just run this in some loop. Let's say 20 times, let's run this. So I think this loop for i in one to 20 do curl, curl command we have already tested. So this should be fine. Let's just see. If you see this, the responses are coming from different, different. This one is different. This one is different. And then there is this one, which is totally different. So we are getting responses from different, different pods. So load balancing is also happening. And if I, let's say for high availability, let's see that as the last thing and we will close the demo and open for questions. Let's go to Cassandra database, let's say our workload. I'll go to Cassandra pod. And there are three pods over there. Okay, zero, one, two. Let's go to number two and let's see if we delete it, what happens? What we expect is that let's say here we are simulating that a container has crashed. So if you see this pods have warnings for Cassandra, that's what it is saying. So we will go there and now it is doing something. What it is doing? It is recreating the lost container, right? So this will give you high availability, even though even if some machine crashes, some container crashes, Kubernetes will restart containers for us. We can look into many more features, but today we have only this much time. I know there can be questions. There are things that we can learn more about this, but we have finite time. So in this finite time, whatever questions I can answer, I will try to answer them. So now it's open to everyone, whatever questions you want to ask, I will answer those questions. Hi all, you may start posting your questions. So how do you want to do it? Uh, Ashutosh, you are going to now project the screen for questions or uh, I can read it 
from my screen i will just bring the chat window anurag as you have answered a few and you were much more comfortable answering directly last okay i i'll go ahead and i'll answer okay so let me start from the first one no vivek asked apps required so vivek i would need clarification over there i think you asked this during a uh, docker demonstration so probably you were asking so i have installed docker desktop on my machine and uh, the containers we what we launched was a java container so on that i have installed java over there not sure which other apps you were talking about so if you can post your follow up question i'll be able to look into that then the next question is how to access the gka cluster from outside to manage it okay so i think this question is already answered in the demonstration when i deployed the system right over here when i ran this script for deployment i ran it on my laptop and these commands were going to kubernetes cluster i had to use that connection right cluster connection i had to establish before doing that so that is the way you send commands to a remote cluster okay then the next question is how did you configure the public ip to the gateway service so that the marketplace is reachable from the outside world okay maruti he got an answer for his question i got answer for my question you are using a load balancer with public ip okay wonderful thank you ashutosh next question is, is from shivangi of... soni sorry yeah so shivangi is asking what is meaning of stateful sets stateful sets are uh, those kind of uh, controllers within uh, kubernetes so there is a, a deployment kind of controller where it will if you ask let's say 10 replicas of an application it will start 10 replicas and it can give any network id to that um which mean if you want to connect to them connect to any one of them and this is okay for stateful applications but let's say you are working with a database and database you have one primary and one secondary then you exactly want to go to primary and when you want to go to secondary you will specify that i want to go to secondary there you want kubernetes to have a distinction between the network identity of those pods so such pods when you create in a cluster you use state stateful sets over there stateful sets will do one more thing it will create let's say if some storage is required for a database then it can create separate storage for each uh, pod that it is creating in that stateful set so it can create separate storage for each one of them so different different databases let's say you are creating they all want to work on their own storage they do not want to work on the same storage because they keep their own copy of their data so in such cases you need stateful set hi so anurag let's go that question is answered yeah then rahul which one is better docker swarm or kubernetes in terms of performance and reliability a kubernetes you would uh, always look performance and reliability in the context of the scale right so kubernetes is clearly better and this is the most popular solution swarm is not that widely used there are very limited um uh, usage of swarm next question is by roshan who is asking if we get a recorded copy of this session roshan yes you get a record a link that's on the website you will get a email shortly with it by tomorrow i think next is by anshita dhavan she is asking i was starting up my devops journey which laptop can i go for devops journey which laptop can i go for you can first try working on cloud machines that is one option um devit can provide you lot of horsepower that you need and uh, 
then after that if your work is getting done on cloud itself then after that you can decide which laptop you want to buy thanks so anurag next is by vivek singh yeah is emacs an app emacs is like your uh, command line and notepad combined into one so that is what is emacs next is by maruti kumar again maruti i think this question stateless means it does not persist any context it does not persist any data uh, related to a context yes stateful means it saves context in dbs or memory it can save it anywhere the point is it saves it manages data for some context yes all right please do share the recording is great i think the questions are done yes even i can see that the questions are done now it was a very interesting q and a session anurag and uh, certainly we all enjoyed the entire talk before we wrap up it is very kind of you to answer each and every question and the non stop queries which kept coming certainly show that it was a very beautiful interactive session thanks anurag once again for being with us today and helping all our participants get more educated about docker and kubernetes eligibility scalability and reliability thank you anurag thank you ashutosh and thank you everyone for listening and attending the demonstration in the meanwhile i like all of you to know at talks are powered by edforce a lineup of finest knowledgeable webinars at talks are crafted and delivered by industry veterans like anurag himself to cater the technical cravings of your workforce and to equip them with the emerging technologies and technical developments from around the globe thank you all stay tuned thank you go on our website also i would request you to please leave your feedbacks you will be getting uh, links on the email and also the zoom feedback is really helpful for us thanks again anurag thank you thank you bye bye i'm ending the session